Now, yesterday, aside from the high drama in Parliament, 41 MPs, members of the Conservative Environment Network, have written to The Telegraph, condemning the latest Just Stop Oil and Extinction Rebellion protests. Let's have a look at their letter. They said the protests have been destructive, disruptive, and are not the right way to combat climate change. They said, as members of the Conservative Environment Network, we will not allow protesters to dominate the debate. This letter follows in the wake of senior Conservative Ben Goldsmith publishing a sympathising tweet with protesters that he later deleted. So is Conservative environmentalism possible or will it always be the purview of those with the loudest voices? Well, joining me now to discuss this is Anthony Brown, Conservative MP for Cambridgeshire South or South Cambridgeshire, I should say, uh, and of course, member of the Conservative Environment Network. Welcome to the programme. Um, why did you feel the need to publish this letter to say to, to, to publicly distance yourself and, and your, your fellow Conservative Environment Network MPs from the actions of Extinction Rebellion? Well, I think we, and certainly I know my constituents, have found it incredibly frustrating, the disruptions to uh, oil supplies. The uh, In South Cambridgeshire, we're actually one of the worst affected regions in the country. And I've no, known people have ended up having to abandon their cars because they can't get uh, fuel. And it's absolutely not the right way to go, to have these uh, incredibly disruptive uh, protests by uh, what I can only really describe as fanatics. I'm, I'm committed to the environment. I used to be environmental editor of the Observer newspaper and the Times newspaper. I'm chair of the all-party parliamentary group of the environment, as well as a member of the Conservative Environment Network. And it's essential that we do get to net zero, but we need to do it in a practical way, in a way that brings the public with us. The government has got a programme for that. We've already made huge progress in the UK. And one of the things that really frustrates me with these uh, these more uh, extremist protesters, as they say, the government isn't doing anything. We've done a huge amount. We've almost cut our emissions in the UK by half since 1990. We've actually got the lowest per capita emissions uh, since uh, the middle of the Victorian era. Really quite extraordinary. Dropping far faster than almost any other uh, developed nation. Our emissions are now less than Germany, they're less than Norway. Uh, we've got a third of the emissions of, of uh, America, Canada and Australia. We're banning the sale of new petrol and diesel cars in eight years' time. We're phasing out coal power stations you know we've now got more renewable energy or zero carbon energy than we we have uh, fossil fuel energy and it's these are extraordinary developments we absolutely need to do more but we can't just go ban all oil and petrol immediately stop people using their cars uh, it would be so not just really economically damaging but actually you'd lose the support of the british public who are generally supportive of environmental measures and you'd end up with some huge terrible backlash and inflict far more pain and misery and economic destruction than is necessary necessary to get to net zero. You know, it is remarkable because those facts that you just set out there are incredibly impressive. The UK in so many ways has been a world leader on these issues, the fastest decarbonisation over the last 30 years of any G7 or G20 country. I spent two weeks up at the climate conference in Glasgow uh, uh, last year where uh, it was remarkable to see all of these different countries in the world wanting to copy the United Kingdom. And yet none of this seems to have filtered through to the British public. No one believes this stuff. I do find, I mean, the government does try to get this message across, but I do find it incredibly frustrating because we, we genuinely do have a really fantastic international record on this. And I meet a lot of MPs from other countries that are interested in environmental issues. And uh, uh, like I recently had a, a round table with MPs from Norway, which is a very environmentally conscious uh, country. Uh, and they're all looking to the UK saying, how have you managed it? You've done extraordinarily well. Uh, but actually within the UK, our, our protesters are saying we're not doing anything. It's just simply untrue. There's we've, we've got such a sort of unified program across government. There's certainly areas where we need to do more. You know, we need to do more in terms of insulating our homes. Uh, we need to work out how what we do with aviation. There's no real solution to that at the moment. But, uh, you know, by and large, uh, it's a very active and energetic program. And I think most members of the public, and certainly speaking to my constituents, I think most of them realise that, that actually this is a you know government committed to getting to net zero. Uh, but still, there's this sort of a fanatic group who... I, I don't know whether they want to bring us back to the Stone Age or just stop modern life or their anti-capitalism or whatever. They can have their views. That's fine. That's democracy. What isn't acceptable uh, is that they then uh, try and impose, uh, get in the way of other people leading their day-to-day lives by closing down oil refineries, by we had protests before closing down uh, print plants so that people couldn't get their newspapers. It has to be said, it's newspapers the protesters didn't agree with. They didn't uh, boycott the, they didn't uh, uh, stop the production of The Guardian, I, I noticed. Uh, but it's, it's 
absolutely right that we protest in this country, but it's absolutely not right that protests to stop other people's going about their day to day lives. It's interesting, though, listening to some of your colleagues uh, talking about this issue who are perhaps not uh, as as uh, pro net zero as you are. They'll say that whatever the government does, these protesters will not accept it. There'll be no way to assuage these sort of protesters. And to some extent, that undermines the cause of acting. Well, I think the risk is with these protesters, and I, I, again, I really detect it amongst my constituents that I speak to, uh, is that the, the public opinion reacts against it, as it were, rather than getting to net zero being a sort of a pragmatic thing that we can do. It's just another technology transition. We've had lots of technology transitions. We went from horse and carts to uh, motorised vehicles. You know, we went from, I'm speaking to you on a flat screen TV here, we went from cathode ray tube TVs to flat screen TVs. You know, we went from uh, uh, coal power powering everything to gas power. Technology transitions is what we do. We can do this. We know how to do it, by and large. Uh, and, you know, people should have confidence that we can get there with enough political will. Uh, the danger of these uh, demonstrations is that people see it as some sort of lunatic thing getting to net zero. And that actually, it's only, you know, associated with uh, a bunch of cranks who don't like modern life, whatever else, because it absolutely isn't. We should get to net zero. Absolutely. Uh, we all, the, the world and the country should, should do it. It requires concerted action, but it's a very sensible and scientifically based things to do. I mean, there is a, uh, as you obviously know, a United Nations panel of uh IPCC that's re made recommendations. We've got the Commission on Climate Change in the UK that's made recommendations, all based on pretty solid science. Getting to net zero by 2050 is what we need to do as a country and as a world. And that's the programme they're working towards. But we can't do it by just banning all oil and, and, uh, and gas tomorrow. That's just, you'll just lose public support. There'll be huge backlash yeah. and the whole agenda will become discredited. And that's my, that's my fear about these, uh, about these protests. But that, you know, you'll always get a fringe with a certain view. There's not, you know, that's tomorrow. There's a wide range of different perspectives. That's great. Uh, and, you know, maybe it all gets a bit more exaggerated by social media and the whole filter bubble and people just... No, no doubt. Live in I'm, I'm afraid chambers. we have run to the end of this segment of the programme, but just in the last 30 seconds, it was a mess in Parliament yesterday. Does the Prime Minister have a... <laughs> I, I, so I couldn't hear the end of your question there, but it, it was it was an extraordinary time. I mean, I actually supported the the Labour motion, and uh, that there needs to be a parliamentary inquiry into whether the government misled Parliament. But uh, having said that, when I when I went to the chamber ready to support the Labour motion, uh, the whole government supported the Labour motion. And there ended up being no vote because no one was opposed to it. So there will be a parliamentary inquiry. It's quite right that it happens after the police inquiry and after the publication of, of the Sue Gray report, because actually at the moment we still don't really know the full scale of of what happened or didn't happen. Uh, we need to let the police process uh, come to its end. We need to find out the uh, what Sue Gray found in her uh, official inquiry, because the, the publication of that has been delayed uh, at the request of the police until the police have finished their investigations. Then when we have all the evidence, we can then have a, a more evidence-based discussion of what should and shouldn't be done. Welcome to the GB News YouTube channel. You can watch us live 24 hours a day, catch up on your favourite shows and join in the conversation in the comments below. Don't forget to subscribe and you'll never miss any of our exclusive content.